here it is. Let's start off right from the Bank of International Settlements. And we're going to start a new project that you might not be aware of. We always talked about, for instance, um, you know, Project Hamilton, uh, Dunbar. We talked about a lot of things. Rosalind, you name it, right? Icebreaker. What about this one? Were you aware about Project Mandela? No, not M Nelson Mandela, right? But, um, yeah, I want to share this with you guys because it's a big deal in regards to quant. So, straight from the BIS, as you can see, Project Mandela shaping the future of cross-board payments and compliance. You do see some of the other ones referenced here. You have the Bank of Australia, Bank of Korea. Remember how many times you used that example of a Bank of Korea? I would always use it for ISO 222. Let's we'll see what you want. There's an example. You have Bank of Nagara, Malaysia, which is the Central Bank of Malaysia. And then you also have the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Now, back to this whole thing about Project Mandela and why I'm sharing it with you guys tonight. And again, thank you to Quant Papa. This explores the feasibility of encoding jurisdiction-specific policy and regulatory requirements into a common protocol for cross-border use cases such as foreign direct investment, borrowing, and payments. Disparate policy and regulatory frameworks between different jurisdictions are among the chief obstacles to smooth and efficient cross-border payments. Now, we do know that. But listen to this. Were you aware that this is going to contribute to the regulatory compliance burden across the payment chain? Now, before we get more into this, this is where standards and understanding standards is such a key thing for you, especially if you're a QNT holder, and understanding the bigger picture and understanding... Gilbert Verdian and his connections, obviously, to the UK uh, finance ministry and everything he's been tied into, the Digital Pound Foundation. Yeah, he resigned, but that's not the point. He doesn't stick with the same company unless this is one that he literally created, right, with Quant Network. He doesn't stick with them forever. He doesn't marry the companies. And if anything, some of us don't even marry crypto. But I might be marrying QNT, right, but that's besides the point. The point is standards. And the UK leading the charge in regards to those standards. So this thing about this regulatory compliance and that burden across their payment chain, how it increases the time for cross-border transactions, introduces uncertainties among stakeholders. Project Mandala is a proof of uh, concept run by BISIH, Singapore Centre, the Reserve Bank of Australia, the Bank of Korea, the Bank of Malaysia, and the Monetary Authority of Singapore. This is a collaboration. And in regards to this collaboration, um, it's going to be with other financial institutions who do what? Are seeking to ease the policy and regulatory compliance burden by automating compliance procedures, proving or providing, I should say, real-time transaction monitoring and increasing transparency and visibility around country specific policies they do reference project uh dunbar here you've heard lewis jackson aka crypto lulu talk about quite a bit last year late last year i want to give you a little bit of an update in regards to this so in regards to these country specific policies um, this is going to aim to address key challenges identified during project dunbar and of course that's developed by uh, this whole thing of experimental multiple central bank digital currency MCBDC platforms. Um, this, of course, envision compliance by design architecture, and it can, or I should say could, enable a more efficient cross-border transfer for any digital asset, including CBDCs. Now, when we get more into this outline, you're going to get to see the point of why I'm making a big deal about this, and if anything, why Quant Papa is as well, because we're going to tie in the whole thing with Quant, but the bottom line is being able to have that compliance and make it more efficient for this whole thing of CBDCs. Tokenized deposits, right? It says it can also serve as the foundation compliance layer for legacy and nascent wholesale retail payments. Um, going down to this part, measures can include quantifiable and configurable foreign exchange rules, monthly laundering measures, you name it, even terrorism measures, crazy stuff. Fast forward to 2023, there's a priority in regards to Project Mandela. It's going to allow for the achievement of G20 um, 
that is going to target enhancing cross-border payments in the area of promoting efficient legal, regulatory, and supervisory environment for cross-border payments while maintaining their safety, security, and, of course, integrity. Now, with everything mentioned there, I know it's a lot to take in, but it had to be the necessary intro for you just don't think, like, what the heck is he talking about later, All right? So you did see some of these ones. And it's referenced from the BIS. And, of course, some of these other ones, like I showed earlier, Bank of Korea, Reserve Bank, all these ones. Again, Bank of Korea. Remember how many times they use the example of, like, the Bank of Greece and then sending a cross-border payment or overseas payment to the Bank of Korea? Yeah, I wasn't just making that up. I thought it was a great example. But the key thing I want to share with you guys is this demo. And it's unlisted, by the way. Funny how that's work, that works. So Quant Papa is, on some things, able to release some info. On some things, he's not. I'm glad to be able to share this with you because I am getting so sick and tired, to be honest, of people doubting Quant. But at the end of the day, in reality, none of it's financial advice, so maybe I shouldn't get sick about it. But somebody in the comments stated they wanted to see a demo, okay? So this is a demo. It's partial. It's a CBDC sandbox. And I want you to think about this for a second. This is also, of course, uh, you know, it's unlisted. It's a direct link. But it comes from the Bank of International Settlements. And it's about five and a half minutes. So we're going to tie in this, of course, with the whole thing with quant. We are obviously understand that Bank of International Settlements has selected quant network, especially when it comes to the overledger to get the job done. But there's another thing that definitely needs to be brought to your attention in regards to the bigger picture of quant. Now, before we get into it, we're going to share this segment. So again, please smash that like. It's about five minutes and 18 seconds. Here we go. Hi, welcome to the Project Denver demo on Patio Sandbox. For demo one, we'll be performing a cross CBDC transfer from SG to AU, where UOB will perform an SGD to AUD transfer using DPS as a settlement bank to complete the PVP. As you can see, we have already set up a UOB SGD CBDC wallet with 10 SGD funded. The corresponding bank DBS also has its wallet set up with a balance of zero. Under non-local banks for the AUD CBDC, the UOB AU wallet has been set up as shown with a balance of zero. We will now then proceed to perform the cross CBDC transfer from UOB SG to UOB AU. We will select UOB SG as the payer and UOB AU as the payee. For the purpose of this demo, DBS has already been set up as a settlement bank for this SGD AUD PVP. The FX rate is quoted as shown, but do note that this will be a snapshot of the rate from August. We will now proceed to transfer 10 SGD. There will be two transfers that will happen. One from UOB to DBS and another from DBS to UOB. The first transfer will start by generating an instruction ID which will be used as an end-to-end -end ID later on. After which, the pre-validation conditions that have been programmed in the smart contract will be effected on UOB SG by DBS SG. Once this is done, an ACSP status code will be written. The completion of the first transfer will be indicated by ACCC. Now, the second transfer of AUD from DBS to UOB will be initiated. A new instruction ID will be generated on the AUD CBDC network. This time, the end-to-end -end ID will be matched to the first transfer's instruction ID. The pre-validation conditions will be performed and completed on DBS and UOB AU. The completion of this will be indicated by an ACSP code again. The second DBS to UOB AUD transfer has been completed, and this completes this cross-border CBDC PVP. We can also see that 
the end-to-end -end ID matches the instruction ID from the SGD payment. We can now see that the balance in UOB's AUD wallet has been updated to 10.18 AUD CBDC. Similarly, we can see the balance in UOB SGD wallet, and that has been updated to 0 SGD, as well as DBS SGD wallet has also been updated to 10 SGD. We will now proceed to demo 2, where we will be performing a domestic AUD transfer from UOB to CBS wallet. We will set UOB as the payer and the transfer amount as 10.18. The payee will be set as CBS wallet for the transfer. The pre-validation conditions will be performed and completed on CBA and UOB AU. The completion of this will be indicated by an ACSP status code. We can see that the domestic transfer has now been completed, indicated by ACCC. We can now see that the balance in CBA's AUD wallet has been updated to 10.18. Likewise, in UOB AUD's wallet, the balance has been updated to zero. Thank you for your time, and we have come to the end of this demo. All right, so some of you guys who may not be, I don't know, on par with the whole thing, that's okay. The bottom line is that is a demo of um, Parshore, which is a CBDC sandbox. And for some people, they were wondering, like, do you have a demo? Well, that answers that. Now, some people, they're excited about it. Some people, there aren't. Maybe it seems a little bit boring. But if you understand the bigger picture of things, then you understand how big that is. For one, it was unlisted. Number two, I want to show you this. Why share that, Max? Great question. So for one, I'm going to pull this back up on the little brandy thing because I like that thing. I'm going to get into this. The demo, Parsher, C uh, CBDC Sandbox, Bank for International Settlements. Project Dunbar worked with who? Parsher to successfully uh, deploy this multi-CBDC platform. All right. We're getting more into this. I'm going to give you an example. And look what's cited right from who? The Quant Network. As you can see, that in the banker, who is this outlet that provides global financial intelligence since 1926, goes on to mention that... Um, sorry about that. I clicked on the wrong thing. Yeah, provides information from 1926... Um, they provide newsletters, updates, right? They're just an, another outlet. But the thing is, there was a piece where they and, of course, Gilbert Verdian, a quant network, discussed Project Caesar Phase 2 times Human Plus. Now, on the previous channel, I did a deep dive about this. And maybe you didn't get the most amount of views. That's not the point. The point was, a lot of times in late 2022, going to early 2023, I got a lot of criticism of people saying I was full of crap when it came to the whole thing of the New York Fed. Um, we, saw, we also had the whole thing of MIT um, and this whole thing of quant, right, um, with a CBDC test pilot, if you will. And then later on, verified that that was a real thing, right? So this project, yes, from... AS or excuse me, MAS and the New York Fed to improve what wholesale um, cross border settlement using multiple currencies. Okay, now here's the short explanation because I don't want to get into the big long article. Um, but this guy, Bill Loomley, of course, has it if you want, it's on banker.com if you want to nerd it out. 
Quant Network gave the examples, and it says CBDCs use underlying distributed ledger technologies that is well placed to solve many wholesale settlement issues. This project examples, examines the data uh, structure, excuse me, and format of CBDCs, specifically how to improve atomic settlement. Gilbert Verdian explains that it enables interoperability and security, giving each central bank, listen to this, participant jurisdictional autonomy, the future of finance today. Now, to get into the real juicy stuff, why point out some of this stuff to you guys? Well, Here's some of the notes, okay? And here's what I'm allowed to share without getting too much trouble. Because obviously I've been in trouble once. And I don't want Quant Papa to get any more trouble either. Background. Project Ubin and multi-CBDCs. Phase five, and this is the biggest I can make it, so I do apologize. Let me see if I can come back. Um, yeah, I'm going to full screen this. This is good. Phase five of Project Ubin successfully deployed a prototype multi-currency wholesale settlement network which enabled issuance or distribution of several digital currencies on a common network. Now think about this for a second. Participants on the network and their customers can transact with other participants on the network directly and around the clock. Most instantly or almost instantly in the different supported currencies. For one, DBS Bank, JP Morgan, yes, you read right, JP Morgan, and Temasek are now leading the development of a live uh, production-grade network transacting on commercial bank money built on the learnings from Project Ubin with pilot trials that happened, of course, back in 2021. Fast forward, of course, to where we're at now, but it also mentions here back then that the successful completion of the experimental project um, since then, I should say, there have been various projects experimenting with similar models. The global interest points towards the viability of using multiple central bank issued digital currency, CBDCs, now commonly known as MCBDC, and its potential for improving cross board payments. In the recent paper titled Multi CBDC Arrangements and the Multi, excuse me, and the Future of Cross Board Payments, published by the Bank of International Settlements. Three models of MCBDC were proposed, and here are those three models. Number one, model one, MCBDC arrangements based on compatible CBDC systems. Again, think about this for a second. Number two, model two, MCBDC arrangements based on linking multiple CBDC systems. I mean, come on, guys. It's literally the writing is on the wall. Number three, MCBDC arrangements based on single multi-currency system now in regards to models two and three they are particularly of interest because they are the direct connectivity between central banks and how they could reduce the need for intermediaries and enable direct transactions between participants in network topology design there are two main paradigms point to point where each network node is connected to all nodes and hub and spoke where a central hub connects all nodes. And of course, the transactions routed through it. I know it was out of the screen, but I couldn't make it any bit bigger. Now, this one I'll blow up a little bit bigger. I'm going to show you this diagram. I'll come, I'm still out of the screen. That doesn't matter. This is just good examples. Let me uh, take off the branding right there so it doesn't block anything. Check out this for a second. Asset transfer mechanism on this particular graph. This gives you a nice visual of the CBDC system. Okay. So you see, for instance, how this all works. For instance, a user, their wallet, how it gets sent to bank A. And then, for instance, the central bank right in the middle, the motion of this, even from bank B. But what about that bridge gateway, right? And how it, you know, sends it down to the bridge um, between them and the buyer. And you know how we always talk about carbon credits? Well, we don't talk about it all the time. But there's even a carbon credit exchange between the two. What about the uh, outside connected mechanisms, right? The seller, for instance, was cited here, the Bank of Korea. So all those examples I gave you guys in the past of, you know, ISO 222, you know, 
garbled up uh, messages with that being sent over to, you know, from the Bank of Greece to the Bank of Korea. Well, now you finally have a little bit of uh, actual visual. All right, goes on to mention that on the contrary, the asset exchange mechanism involves exchange of assets and money issued on separate ledgers between participating parties in transactions. This approach primarily employs atomic swap type smart contracts. For example, hash time lock contracts, which is referred to as HTLC. This mechanism does not necessitate a direct linkage, of course, between the asset ledger and the money ledger. However, at present though, Research and experimentation on HTLCs, again, those are hash time lock contracts, are underway. Nevertheless, it is worth noting that the asset exchange mechanism could prove challenging to implement for transactions involving three or more parties. Moreover, the processing speed for transactions by the, utilizing this mechanism may be relatively moderate. Consequently, its applicability may be restricted, especially in cases involving substantial, and listen to this part, if you have lost or fell asleep, I don't know, because it's kind of dry, substantial transaction volumes, ooh, with smaller amounts per individual transaction. Now, here's the key highlight. In Project Cedar, times you've been plus, the New York Fed, that's right, the New York Fed and the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is the MAS, have recently explored potential approaches to enhance wholesale cross-border multi-currency payments and settlements involving the utilization of just that HL, uh, HTLC, again, those hash time lock contracts. All right, let me jump into this. I'll come back in the frame on this one. All right, why share some of this stuff? Well, for one, why not? But here is what was cited back from Quant, the Quant Network, all right? Like we just shared with you before. Gilbert Verdian discussed Project Cedar Phase 2 Yuvin and, of course, the project between MAS and the New York Fed, right? Been there, done that. Let me jump to this. Another thing that was needing to be reference and i'll come back out of the frame for this one for you can see it as this part that's highlighted towards the bottom and it says for instance in regards to the source excuse me the start top left the bank of korea where's some of the considerations in regards to this laws and regulation i'm not going to read all that but the key thing is this it talks about tokenized deposits and how they've been designed to closely resemble listen to this traditional deposits in structure with the only difference being the technical form factor utilizing blockchain tech you want an example you better believe we're going to give you an example applying the burn and issue transfer process similar to the existing fast payment system and having a private key under a bank's custody both mirror the current and operation of deposits Moreover, to eliminate the legal or any legal uncertainty, the FSC plans to apply its financial regulatory. What? Did you not see the key things I said to share with you earlier? Sandbox reg uh, regimens or regimes. I can't even pronounce that right anymore. To the issuance, excuse me, and circulation of DCI by banks. Right. So again, plans day. Burn an, ad, an issue transfer process, because some of you guys ask about, like, on some of these ones, how do we go about burning some of it? And then what about this? How do we tie in that example that we just shared from the Bank of International Sa uh, Settlements in regards to that specific sandbox? Again, boom, right there. Now, getting into a little bit more about this, I'll leave this screen up. Talks about Project Cedar and Yubin again, right? So above that, I don't know why this part isn't highlighted, but that's okay. It says, indeed, the off-chain information exchange remains crucial for transactions between trading parties. But in regards to Project Cedar, Times Yubin Plus, the New York Fed and the Monetary Authority of Singapore have recently explored potential approaches to enhance, of course, wholesale cross-border multi-currency payments and settlements. Involving what? The utilization of HTLCs. 
All right. In closing, before we get, I think we're almost at closing, about 90% done. Let's pull this up. Gilbert Verde incited here. This is something you want to pay attention to. So Gilbert stated a while back, let me see how long ago. Um, actually, not that long ago. It was October 5th. I read that wrong. So literally, was that four days ago? Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's not really time sensitive. But this is good stuff. See how we tie in things from the past? So we went back to 2021, did we not? Now some of you guys are like, you know, maybe some of the criticism, like, can you give me something new, Max? I don't want to read all that old stuff. All right, I hear you, but again, it's a nice outline. Gilbert Verdian states, we've recently announced Quant Protect, our cybersecurity services for enterprising, excuse me, enterprises, transforming their business models, applications, and workflows to digital assets and blockchain with a nascent technology the technical and security challenges for enterprises to adopt new safely or new tech safely into their business environments are high yeah like to say the least 2022 highly the risk to digital assets and money if the underlying code is insecure or contains vulnerabilities that malicious actors exploit for their gain now listen to this stat for size almost 4 billion usd was lost of course in 2022 alone Smart contracts, because we know that, you know, when it comes to quant network, we have all sorts of different examples in regards to um, secure smart contracts. They have evolved to be mission critical components of an organization's digital asset strategy. Underlying empowering digital asset transactions relied upon by institutions and users of those services. Now listen to this part also. Using a combination of static in dynamic analysis with expert assessment, we've developed new tools and methodologies to protect against this increasing threat. Hence why we did that piece not that long ago in regards to this new smart audit. I mean, it is a really, really big deal. But Quant Network, especially Gilbert Verdi, is stating that with smart audit, they're able to start this whole thing of enterprise security solution for companies designing and writing smart contracts to assess and remediate any security risks in an automated way, which can be integrated into release and deployment pipelines. So remember earlier, we were just talking about the whole thing of, you know, flare, right? That's a big deal. And that's obviously the solution. How would you like to have something in which now, because we're comparing the two, now you can have, for instance, this thing with Quant's Overledger, because you can take their tech, if you will, with Flare, and basically be able to remediate, like it says, any security risk in an automated way, and can integrate this into basically any pipeline. Any. That's a big deal. It's This will complement even that. I think that's a good thing to have this work with other ones i mean is that the whole point of quant interoperability um but also complementing systems current systems old systems and new systems flare is a new system i mean it's young right as an additional layer of security your smart contracts can be protected even further with overledger to write um excuse me to authorize and securely co-sign smart contracts to protect against key management risk and on-chain attacks. So for me, let's say, again, back to that example in regards to Flare. Um, I have, for instance, a project that I'm building on the XRPL. Um, and if anything, it's like, well, you know, uh, I realize that, you know, Flare allows me to have that plug, if you will, uh, when it comes to smart contract functionality. And now I want to take it to the next level again, enter into, you know, the whole thing with quant, right? Um, goes more into this. It says, uh, yeah, protect against key management risk and on-chain attacks. We are bringing as in quant network, our heritage in cybersecurity to make the transition to digital asset enterprise grade interoperable and secure. Yeah. Basically what I just said. And of course you could contact them on how to do that, but, uh, that's the disclaimer. He's not sending this out to us as in retail investors for our own reference, that is more pointed towards, hey, we're open for business to who the institutional grade 
players of the world that Quant is here to thrive and that they're here to tokenize not just assets, but they're here to get smart contracts done by making them what? More secure and creating that pipeline, literally like it just said earlier, um, you know, to make it all come together. You know, and I think that's a big, big deal like this right here. Yeah, integrate into release and deployment pipelines. I mean, that, that example in regards to Flare, I think that is a good analogy. Absolutely. Now, there's a little bit more that I need to share. Let me see how I'm doing my time. So I'm, I'm going to have to wrap this up here soon. I'm going to have to go rapid fire. This is another thing that Quant Papa wants to bring to our attention. And we're going to tie this all in. So this guy, David Cunningham, I want you to pay attention to this as well. This is really, really good coverage. Some of you guys have tagged me in regards to the whole thing of City. You may think on crypto Twitter, I take Max, but I don't know if he sees everything. I try to see as much as I can, you know. Um, but there's some things that slip through, but you got to keep in mind, I do try to pay attention to all of it. And I have seen some you guys who've been tagging me. Max, what about this whole thing, QNT and City? Do you look more into that? Hey, hey, I'm here. Let's get into it. So David Cunningham, head of strategy and partnerships for digital assets, treasury, and trade solutions at what City? He has this quote, and I think this is worth sharing. He says, the world of cross-border payments is at an inflection point as the ecosystem, again, remember this, ecosystem is shaken up by a new you know, competition and the technologies. There will inevitably be winners and losers. Yeah, no kidding. All players must remain nimble and adapt if they are to retain their market share and thrive. That's why I was talking about thriving earlier. City's latest Future of Finance GPS report is out, and Ronit Ghost and the team have done it again. It's tremendous. It details, and I want you to listen to this because we did talk about Bank of International Settlements, so you better believe we've got to talk about the Bank of England at some point. You never dismiss them. This talks about how the Bank of England estimates cross-border climate payments is set, and I guess I just want to state this, okay? This is the juicy right the juicy stuff you've been waiting for set to increase from 150 trillion in 2017 to what over five or 250 trillion by 2027 this is how we get to those crazy market caps that some of you guys just don't think are this ever going to happen that means billions in revenue <clears throat> the cross-border payments revenue pie is already at over 200 billion and expanding at a high single digit annual growth rate. You also see how digital assets, of course, will play a significant role. I mean, I know I'm reading laws but verbatim, but in reality, it's hard to just take pieces of this and just say, oh, here's a quick summary. Because when you look more into it, it's like, yeah, I didn't want to leave that out. I didn't really want to leave that out. And I don't, I don't think you guys would appreciate it too much if I left a lot of it out. Here's this other quote. This is from Jane Fraser. Okay. She states, our industry is on a journey to reach the next phase of evolution with cross-border payments. We're partnering closely with financial institutions, fintechs, corporates, and industry experts, all whom have contributed their perspectives in this paper to continue building best-in-class experiences for clients and using technologies such as AI, digital assets, to make it happen. Now, again... Remember when I tied in the whole thing of what Aladdin and how I tie that into, for instance, the institutions and I did the whole quant connection right there is the writing on the wall yet again. Okay. So getting down into this part about it, this comes from Shamir Kalik. Who is he? He's the global head of services of who city. Some of you guys call it Citibank, but City. Future cross-border payments who will be moving $250 trillion in the next five years. The world of cross-border payments as an inflection point. The ecosystem is going to blow up, right? It's inevitable. But he goes on to this part about where he mentions specifically 24-7 real-time experience both uh, domestically and across borders in regards to the evolving landscape and the changing of behaviors of transparent, streamlined tech. Talks about specifically competition and how it's increasing in regards to multifaceted industries, the payments that are moving away from the traditional instruction methods, um, which are tied into batch files, so on and so forth. But look what he says here. Moving 
they, they feel as though they need to move toward application program interface, API. We know that Quant stands out in regards to APIs big time, right? Like literally like the king when it comes to that. And it says, for instance, connectivity. This is a leading thing that is going to this heightened opportunity for both fintechs and other participants um, that will be enabled through traditional financial infrastructures. Regulation is also increasingly fostering innovation via initiatives such as open banking. And there has been con a consequent increase in players that deliver tech, right? Who are some of those players? Think about it, guys. Nibbly and leverage digital client experiences as a differ inching, I can't even pronounce it, differentiating, can't say it anymore tonight. I read too much sometimes. Differentiating, excuse me, factor, okay? All right, jumping into this next part, what we have, there's about two videos, really good videos to get into. Um, and so here it is. This was from October 5th. So you guys want some of that new news, right? So I tie in the old and bring you the new. Shout out to Quan Papa. City developing what? Token services for who? Institutional clients. October 5th, 2023, City announced recently is developing a tokenization service for cash management and trade finance for institutional clients using what? Blockchain tech and smart contracts. Ryan Rugg, what a name, right? God, Ryan Rugg, please don't start a meme token. <laughs> and Stephen Randall from City's Treasury and Trade Solutions discuss the move and what kind of interest they are seeing from institutional clients. We're going to go ahead and jump into this. This will be the final bit of recovery for tonight, and it's going to be a video. This comes from Coindesk. We do cite them quite often, and you know who this lady is for the most part. This is eight minutes and 40 seconds. It needs to be played. If quant is your thing and general, generational wealth is your game, then smash that like because you want to know something. I don't need to hype it up. Quant speaks for itself. Here we go. City announced recently it's developing token services for institutional clients. Joining us now to discuss is Ryan Rugg, Global Head of Digital Assets for City's Treasury and Trade Solutions, along with Stephen Randall, Global Head of Liquidity Management Services for City Treasury and Trade Solutions. Welcome to the show, Ryan and Stephen. Hi there. Thanks for having me. All right, let's talk about this pilot. There was a pilot for city token services. Smart contracts were used to serve the same purpose as bank guarantees and letters of credit. You worked with the shipping company Maersk. Talk to us about what happened. What was the benefit here for Maersk? No, that's great. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. So last month we announced city token services for cash and for trade. And what we did was we took tokenized deposits and we pre-funded a smart contract for trade. So in this case with Maersk, you know, if they were passing through the a canal, they were able to pre-fund a smart contract and if a set of conditions were met, the funds were released. And you could think about in trade, it's a very paper-ridden business operationally and typically only works during banking hours. So really adding efficiency for that. And for the cash piece, I'll turn it over to Stephen, who's head of uh, liquidity for city. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. So, so in terms of what we do in liquidity management services, we help clients manage their cash and liquidity. So what City Token Services does, it aims to address those client pain points uh, with the current settlement systems. And so what, what we did with this effectively for the MERS transaction is we used and leveraged that uh, City Token Services for cash and tokenize those deposits on blockchain in order to be able to reduce friction and, and make it more seamless for our clients. So, uh, does this actually, uh, it, was there a need for doing it on blockchain? Why couldn't it be done on a centralized database? Uh, what, what kind of things can be offset, if you will, you, you talk about liquidity here, uh, you know, what kind of tokens were, 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 transact, uh, were, were exchanged in the process to, to do all this? And is there any connection with the overall markets that, that somebody, let's say, could, could offset the risk using uh, crypto markets, for instance? Yeah, so, so what City Token Services for Cash does is it uses tokenized deposits on an internal blockchain uh, to enable corporate clients to move money between their accounts around the city network instantaneously on a 24 by 7 basis. The first two branches that we're using are New York and Singapore for internal US dollar transactions. So this service aims to reduce the friction 
of that client liquidity management by leveraging it internally and so the clients get the benefits externally. So hopefully hopefully that, that helps answer that question. Well, Ryan, you were saying? Yeah, yeah, and if you think about, you know, I get asked that question all the time. Do you need a blockchain? Why are you using a blockchain? Could, you know, another, you know, technology have been used. And it's, it's not about the technology. It's about what our clients want. And what our clients want is cross-border multi-bank liquidity. Right. They want to be able to move money 24 seven, 365 and make it programmable. So for that, the best technology and we evaluated numerous, to be honest, was a was a permission blockchain, because if you think of the work that we've done with the regulated liability network and the Fed and a consortium of banks, how do you connect disparate parties that don't normally trust one another into a, into one ledger? So, yes, you know, today with an internal use case, do you technically need a blockchain? No. But in the future, to be able to provide that 24-7 cross-border, cross-bank liquidity, you do. And, and, and what, sort of, uh, uh, what sort of platform did you use? It, it, was it about, based off of Ethereum? What, what exactly were you using here for it? Yeah, we used ERC-20 tokens, EVM compatible. Um, it was a private permission version of Ethereum that, that we were on. But open source, it was very important that you know, we're future-proofing our infrastructure also. Notice how she just kind of danced around that. Are you guys paying attention to this? ERC-20, it was private. Probably because of NDA, right? Think about it for a second. I mean, really, when you dive more into it, let's play this a little bit more. And she talked about not being a blockchain. As we know, Quant Network is blockchain agnostic. So some people say, but she mentioned ERC-20. Again, what the heck is Quant? So much more than ERC-20 token. That should be your proof. That should be a ha moment right there. I'm going to play a little more, but I just didn't want you guys to just let that go over your head, okay? And sometimes I have to do stuff like that. Let's play a little more. And what kind of interest are you seeing from institutional clients? I mean, is this something that, because there's, there's a lot of, you know, different accounts out there about institutions' interest in, in this kind of thing. Are you seeing a, a, a strong, strong interest? Yeah, absolutely. We've definitely seen a lot of interest in this, which is very positive in the market. And, you know, as mentioned, like this is just one of the solutions that City is developing. But, you know, COVID exasperated this digital economy that we're in and a need for always on infrastructure. And how are we going to be able to provide that? And City Token Services is one of them. So, you know, the first two use cases that we kind of rolled out that we're alive with are for cash and for trade. Um, but with aspirations of kind of expanding that, as I mentioned, with RLN and other initiatives that we're working on. Any plans to use the public blockchain? That's a great question. That's going to really depend on regulation, right? Currently, right now, within the we are, you know, we do not operate in the gray area, right? You know, and with right now with the regulatory regime that we're in and like the guidance that we have, we can only be on permission change. So we have no aspirations unless regulation changes go, to going public. On the topic of regulation, I I have to inject one more time. So. All the references that we mentioned earlier in regards to regulation. Here, here's the other thing that's beautiful about Quant's overledger being blockchain agnostic. Think about what she just mentioned. You know, they're literally trying to hammer on, on like, you know, which blockchain? Because I mean, that would be massive news if she just came out and basically said it. But in regards to regulations, right? We understand that basically it's like, wow, you know, by having this not be specific to one blockchain, Quant Network being blockchain agnostic. That's game changer if you think about it. It's like she doesn't have to commit to one specific blockchain at all. You know, that, that takes that element out of it to begin with. Um, if anything, she could even use a few, right? So, again, she already let the cat out of the bag when she mentioned ERC-20 and also from a private point of view. Um, she also mentions in regards to, like, well, the whole thing with regulations. So it's like... Okay, you are, but you're not. And if you are, but you're not, it's like, then who is that? And again, draw your own conclusion, right? I mean, I'm trying to convince anybody. I just bring you guys the presented material. We're going to play a bit more about this because I actually have to get going here soon. But uh, this should open your eyes to say this. This is all recent news. So the old news, the new news. Let's play the last bit of this. Here we go.
regulation when you're testing, when you're doing pilots with companies like Maersk? What kind of questions are they asking when it comes to regulation? Are things like the Sam Bankman Free Trial affecting how they view the technology and they view working um, with you on projects like this? So we've made it seamless into our infrastructure, and that was by design. So we've obfuscated all of the complexities with a blockchain and made it seamless for our clients. So, you know, you log on to your typical city direct account or through an API and have like a seamless experience. So for them, it's not a lot of questions about, you know, kind of what's going on in the space because they know that from a, you know, infrastructure standpoint, it's fully integrated into our systems. So, uh, Stephen, and then Ryan, you know, what kind of in, what kind of institutions are you guys seeing uh, asking for these kind of services? You know, we asked if there was any interest, but I, it, it, how does it look? I obviously Maersk, uh, a big shipping company, but anybody else? Yeah, let, let, I'll take that first, and then pass over to Ryan. I, I think across the spectrum, if you think about you know the the, the client base we serve, there, there's there's a di diverse interest uh, across different different sectors. So some of some of those clients are further further advanced in in their thinking in this space, and so you know in terms of the test transactions that we do, they they are uh, the first. But others are still sort of evolving their thinking. So I, the way I would think about it is. As we evolve and we're at the, the sort of this the, the innovation uh, stage of this, there are certain clients that are, are partnering with us on on this through the through the test phase, and others that, that will will come on board uh, as they've seen others and they've seen the use cases evolve. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Definitely more innovative clients we're kind of engaged with right now that are you know testing it and making sure that from a you know it's actually serving their use case and helping us to like really co-develop and co collaborate with us on our roadmap as well. You know, we want to make sure that this, you know, really solves the pain point that they're trying to do. And, the, you know, we're always on infrastructure 24 seven, 365. So if it's 5 PM in New York on Friday and 5 AM in Singapore, they're able to send money to be able to have that, you know, because currently right now, like liquidity is trapped in many different areas and it's an inefficient use of liquidity being able to not, you know, having to send it, you know, two or three days prior versus being able to, you know, invest it in our money. So really being able to enable our clients to do that. And especially like the kind of the early adopters in this program. But besides shipping, any other industries? Yeah, we've seen multiple in industries interest, especially, you know, now that we have the announcement out there that where it's, it's really diverse because anything that you can think of like where you have paper written contracts, right, to be able to pre-fund them and automate that process. And so if, you know, in this case with Maersk, if a set of services were received, so if the ship received fuel or was washed or whatever the case is, the conditions are met, the funds are automatically released first having to have, you know, paper written kind of contracts. So I, you could see the applicability in multiple different industries across um, the space here. Yeah, it's, it's not one sector. It's not one industry. It, it, it's depending on the footprint of that, that sector or industry as to, and their evolution in, in that space as to their, their adaptab adoptability of this. Stephen, Ryan, thanks so much for joining the show this morning. Thanks for having thanks us. Thanks very much. That was Ryan Rugg and Stephen Randall from Cities Treasury and Trade Solutions Business. Okay, um, in closing, and I'm gonna do my best to just read this a, a bit of comments here in a second, but um, I do have to close this out real quick and I wanna finish this, all right? I want you guys to see this because it's good stuff. So we're gonna share this part because some of you newcomers may be wondering like, well, is there anything really in regards to Quantum City? And the answer is definitely 100% yes. So here's something from a while back in regards to just that, and it is straight from the Quant Network. Let's go ahead and cite this and bring it up on your screen. And basically speaking, you see this posted originally on April 11, 2023, and it talks about City and how they predicted four trillions of four trillion of tokenized assets, right? And you know, you got to keep in mind, like it says, uh, banking giant expects four trillion to five trillion. Let me just come back into the frame for a second. Yeah, four to five trillion of tokenized digital securities, right? Think about the securities and one trillion of distributed ledger technology based trade finance volumes by 2030. Uh, it goes into all sorts of detail on the far right. We believe we are approaching an inflection point where the promised potential of blockchain will be realized and be measured in billions of users and trillions of dollars in value. Billions and trillions. Crazy stuff, right? Um, and if anything, we, we actually have this higher. 
when we enter into some of the other ones, right? We talk about these Bitcoin and SPY ETFs. There's a lot of money that's going to be coming and flowing into this space of crypto, okay? Um, they have this other report here, basically. <clears throat> it says, get ready for a CBDC versions of the euro, the British pound, the Indian rupee. Together, these four jurisdictions constitute more than 25% of the global population and 22% of global bank deposits. Uh, hence why they think CBDCs could have at least 2 billion users and 5 trillion plus in circulation and have uh, and half could be using partly DLT linked models. Why is the U.S. largest you know, bank so bullish on CBDCs? Of course, four key things. Um, more big countries are catching up. Um, they have this whole thing of billions of users, like they talked about earlier, the tech. Um, talking about also how money can be mobilized. I'll end on this part. Central banks estimate to 20% of deposits and how that can transaction uh, transact to newer digital money formats and how 5 trillion of CBDC circulating in major economies in the world in this decade, half would be basically on DLT. So it's crazy stuff. You know, we can talk about how the world's assets will be tokenized. Again, back to the whole thing of Larry Fink. And in closing, um, basically speaking, I want to just share this closing remarks, closing comments I have with you because I, I do really have to really wrap it up. And I do see a super chat came in. I do appreciate it. I'll get in that in just a second. So here's my own notes. Some people are wondering, does Quant Network have a partnership with City? The answer is yes. Welcome to the channel, just in case you weren't caught up on some of this stuff. So basically, the partnership was originally announced September of 2021, if you're wondering where that reference comes from. Um, and of course, it aimed to explore the potential of blockchain tech to transform the financial industry. Uh, one of the key areas of focus in regards to that partnership, since you're probably wondering about that, is the development of central bank digital currencies, hence why this outline tonight talks specifically about that. In regards to Quant Network's overledger. That platform provides, of course, a way to connect different blockchain systems and networks to just that, to make it interoperable with the CBDC system. No kidding. Now, in addition to this specific partnership, it also explores the use of blockchain tech to tokenize, of course, assets, hence why we cover this all the time, such as securities and even real estate. Shout out to Will Fix talking about the whole thing with real estate. And we'll do a collaboration in regards to more talk of the tokenization of real estate um as we know that this is going to help financial markets be more efficient accessible in a wider range for just that investors and so on this partnership in regards to quant network and city is so significant for numerous reasons but let me just double check my notes basically for blockchain industry but it shows that there is major financial institutions that are increasingly interested in blockchain tech to improve just that, their flow, their operations, and how they go about this new monetary system that's going to happen. In addition to the partnerships with City Quant Network, also, of course, partners with various other ones, big ones, including leading financial institutions, according SIA. We cover that numerous times. Shout out to Tokenizer as well. He does it. UST. No, not, you know, the one from Terra, different one. And of course, R3 is so huge, massive. These partnerships, if you're wondering, demonstrate how the Quant Networks has a commitment to working with the financial industry to develop and implement just that, blockchain solutions. So in closing, do you hold QNT? Do you understand the greater picture of it? Or are you getting flooded out by people who have simply not taken the proper deep dive in regards to the research? If the research trumps flood 110%, why aren't you standing by the research? You know what you hold and you know why you hold it. So in closing, I'm going to read the last bit of the comments, the super chat, and then I have to go. I hope that you guys enjoyed the coverage that was shared here tonight. And a big up and thanks to the one and only Quant Papa for his great research that both him and I will continue to bring and inform the people of the world, whether we're at 1,500 subs or 150,000 subs.